I'm talking from um, Hebrews 11 this morning, so if you could turn to Hebrews 11. And uh, <clears throat> my subject is Moses. Let me read, I'm going to read Hebrews 11 verses 1 and 2, then 6, and then 23 to 29 for reasons that will become obvious. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. And then down to verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then down to verse 23, the section on Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Hebrews 11 is, um, <coughs> is the, the Bible's, it's, it's the, the best book to go to when you understand, want to understand the, the subject of faith. I, I spoke a couple of weeks ago in, um, in Lim on the subject of grace, while well, I was speaking on John 1 and 2, so I covered grace. And I made this statement, I said, grace is the benefit which we receive from God, which is not a result of our effort, but only of God's goodwill towards us. And grace is the thing that sets Christianity apart from any other world religion, and I've read a lot about them. Grace is absolutely unique. But there is a part, although grace is something which we receive as a free gift from God, okay, we cannot earn our forgiveness, we cannot earn our blessing, it is God that gives, but there is normally, and I put that in there for a very specific reason, that is normally a part that we do have to play. There are occasions when God completely unilaterally just, just lays out his grace in, in a situation. There are situations. But mostly, and you read this in the Bible, because mostly you find very frequently Jesus says the term, your faith has made you well. Over and over and over again in the New Testament, your faith has made you well. We read there that it says, without faith it is impossible to please him. So faith is our part of grace. And for me, that was the most difficult thing I found about receiving the blessing of God, was simply being willing to believe that God was simply because he loved me, give me the blessing. That, I found that really hard to get. Faith is not natural to us. Okay? A whole educational system, don't worry, I've got a loud voice. <laughs> a whole educational system teaches us that faith is rubbish. Okay, we're taught seeing is believing. I, I heard a story some years back about a couple of missionaries who went to some country in Central Africa, I forget the details, it was a long, a long time ago I heard it, um, and they, they went, they, this was just before the Second World War, and they labored for a long time in this country, and finally one person turned his heart to the Lord, and they taught him to read, and they left him a Bible. And then the Second World War happened, and their mission society withdrew them, came back to the England, and after the war, they went out there, and from what I hear from the story, they were astounded at what they found going on. Because this man, who was able to read, read the Bible, and simply believed. And people were being healed, and people were being raised from the dead, and there were all manner of miracles going on, because they read, and they simply believed. Our educational system says, you don't believe until you prove. Okay? That's the foundation of our system. But 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk, says we walk by faith, not by sight. What Sarah spoke this morning about David, 
It's so many occasions in the Bible. See, we have to understand this as Christians, that the world does not end with what we see and understand and smell and taste and feel. It doesn't end there. There's another side of life. There's another element of life. There's other powers that, that exist in our experience that we cannot prove by the laws of nature. And unless we get hold of that, unless we can understand that and believe that there's an influence that God has on that area, then we'll never, we'll never live in faith. Because faith is where we see what is unseen. But there is a God who can change the circumstances. We don't just live by what we understand. And in the stories that I'm going to talk to you about, you understand that you've got to have that. If you don't have that, and one of the problems I have um, <clears throat> is that it's very easy as Christians. I, I, was, I wasn't brought up in a Christian environment. I was brought up in an un-Christian un culture. But in my late teens, I became a Christian and I moved into a church environment. And I absorbed church culture. And churches have cultures. We learn the language, we learn the songs, we learn how to speak, we learn how to be with each other, and we can absorb, be absorbed into it. And, and life church has a culture. It's quite different to my own church culture, but there's sufficient similarities so that I could fit. Okay? And I'm not saying that's all bad. We learn moral values from the culture, we learn the things you do and you don't do, but what we don't learn is faith. Faith is only learned through your experience with God. And I want to take you through a man who had to learn faith. God had a specific purpose for the man Moses. And it was absolutely essential that Moses learned faith. Now let me look, um, <clears throat> on that set of readings that, uh, that uh, I read through, there's a whole series of readings where it says, by faith. Now the last one of these, in, um, I'm skipping my notes here, in verse 29 it says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. That is man-sized faith. That is faith that we expect. That is parting of the water's faith. That is water from a rock faith. That is the faith that we think, yeah, that's faith. <laughs> and it took him 80 years to get there. <laughs> that's 80 years old he was when that happened. Because what I want to show you is that, yeah, that's great. I haven't got that faith. I wish I did. <laughs> But what I love about the story of Moses is how small it started. God loves to bring us to faith. Faith is the most perfect expression of love. Worship is wonderful. But if I love somebody, I will believe that what they say is true. I will trust them because I love them. God wants to bring us to faith. So in Hebrews 11:23 it says Moses by faith Moses when he was born was hidden for 3 months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. The strange one when you're talking about faith this is a demonstration of faith. I mean the situation was this. Moses was born somewhere between 1300 and 1500 BC. Okay? So that's about 3500 years ago. He was born <coughs> into, in, in an environment that was probably the most advanced culture of that age. We're talking about the Bronze Age here. The Egyptian culture, which is where he was born, were probably the most advanced society on the face of the earth at the time. Um, but Moses himself was, uh, he was a Hebrew. Okay? The Hebrews at this point had been living in Egypt for about 430 years. Now, to, to, to make a comparison, 430 years ago from today, Queen Elizabeth I was on the, on the throne. So that's a long, long time. They were living among them, but they, they hadn't absorbed, they hadn't been absorbed into, and very often you find cultures that move into another culture absorbed, but the Hebrews hadn't. And the primary reason for this is probably the fact that they were monotheists. The, the Egyptians, they worshipped a whole host of gods. Okay, the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they worshipped one God. That was a fundamental of the Hebrew religion. It, it's quite interesting, at this time there was a pharaoh called Eknaton who decided he was going to be a monotheist. Around about the same period, historical, historians argue about whether there was an influence. Um, we don't know what Eknaton looked like because when he died, the priests of the other religions hated him so much they had his face wiped out from every single depiction of him. So, the Egyptians hated the idea of monotheism. 
But the Hebrews, who had lived there for 430 years, were monotheists. And what happened is, I mean, you, if, if you know your Bible, you know that originally they were invited to be there. Joseph, um, who came down, he became the first minister of Egypt. But time came when um, new pharaohs, obviously 430 years, new pharaohs uh, ascended. And um, a pharaoh came who decided that they were a threat. Okay? Here were these people living among them, who'd been there for 430 years, but they were a threat. It's actually fascinating, the fact that the, the rhetoric of xenophobia, fear of anything different, hasn't changed in three and a half thousand years. The arguments are still the same. These people are a threat. They're a threat to your jobs, blah 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 whatever else they are. They use the same language. And the interesting thing is, it's, I was just, um, skipping a bit here, but you know, he, he, he brought about a couple of things. First of all, he said, let's make them forced labor. Okay, let's, we want to keep these people down. They're a threat to us. You know, they're the poor of the land. They've been here 430 years. Why should they? I mean, his fear was that they would join with someone invading. But they, these were, you know, they've been living there for 430 years. Um, but he said, right, let's make them do forced labor. We talk about slavery. It wasn't slavery in the terms that we would understand it. They still lived at home. They weren't owned. But they were forced to do major works, major building works. They built the city of Ramesses, for example. And when that didn't work, what he was trying to do was weaken them. And when that didn't work, he said, um, okay, we don't want them to have sons. We don't want them to have fighting men. And the interesting thing is, I remember seeing a, a children's book of Bible stories, and uh, it showed um, a Hebrew mother hiding her child away from soldiers. That's not what the Bible says. Pharaoh told his people to throw the babies into the Nile. Xenophobia is a, is a strange thing. You can get people to do the weirdest things if you convince them that someone's a threat and that person is different to them. Anyway, I'm not here to talk politically. Um, that's the environment that Moses was, uh, was born into. At the time when Moses was born, there was an edict that said any male child born of a Hebrew should be thrown into this crocodile-infested river, the Nile. And it says they didn't because he was a beautiful child. <laughs> you know, I, I, when my first, when my son was born, my firstborn, um, they had photographers who used to go around Warrington General Hospital and take pictures. And I had a picture of him four or five hours old. And uh, I, I, at the time, I was a teacher, and I took this, this picture so proud. You know, it, was my, it was my firstborn son. Took him into the school where I was teaching and, you know, all the ladies, oh, he's a lovely baby. And then some guy said to me, as we guys do, he said, he looks like he's done 10 rounds in a ring with Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and when I looked at it, yeah, he was, I understand that babies do get all scrunched up and the head's out of shape. I, I believe that's natural, you know, with newborn babies. But I just thought this child was so beautiful, you know. And when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, okay, you know, he hasn't changed a lot since. But... Um, <laughs> But what mother, this is what I'm getting at, it says, by faith, she hid him. You're not telling me that all the other Hebrew women said, oh, I've had a son, here you go. So what made her different? Why is she singled out? Why is that faith? She did what instinctively any mother would do. It's one of those things, it's a bit like the difference between Cain and Abel, that the Bible doesn't tell us a lot, so we've, we've got to guess at it. But I come down to this. Well, let, let me put it this way. When I was in my teens, I became an atheist. You know, most atheists are made that way by Christians. It's a fact. I was. Look in the background of most adamant atheists, you will find people who are religious, one form or another. And I became an atheist through what I'd seen. And, uh, but a friend of mine who happened to be a Christian uh, did, did me a favor. And then he asked me to go to church. And I couldn't really refuse. Um, so I went along this church. And for the first time in my life, I saw people who enjoyed being in church. My background was the hat parade, you know. My parents were nominal, uh, nominal Anglicans. And so you'd go along on a Sunday morning and it'd be unbelievably boring. And everybody, all the women wore hats. But I went to this church 
I remember, I remember going, thinking now, why are these people underlining things in their Bible? I just didn't understand it. But here's the problem. I was an atheist. I had thought it through. Logically, I said, there is no God. How can there be a God? I've read the books. I've made my decisions. I, I've got all the logic. But I saw something that gave me hope. And although logically, I said, there is no God, I saw hope. And because I had hope, despite the logic of my head, when at the end of the meeting, the pastor of this little Baptist church in Bath, in Somerset, or Avon now, when he said, if you want to receive the Lord Jesus, come to the front. Hope with an action. In its simplest form, that's all faith is. And this lady had hope. She took an action. I don't know what would have happened to me if that day I'd have gone home and, and had hope and not done anything about it. I trust the Lord would have brought me to that situation again, but I believe the Lord ultimately doesn't. There comes a time when he presents and presents and presents and there comes a time when he ceases to strive with us. But, by the grace of God, I saw hope and I acted. Faith is not this great thing it starts off, as Jesus said, small as a mustard seed. And this dear lady had hope. And she acted. And that tiny, tiny little bit of faith changed the world. By faith, Moses, the result, it was just skipping on a bit. It's a, it's a funny thing. I said last, last a couple of days to, to Sue, and I think I mentioned it when I spoke about grace. Um, <clears throat> the things that we receive from the hand of God are so much more abundant than the things that we engineer for ourselves. She came to a point, she must have been thinking, oh, I can do this, and I can do this, and I can hide him, and I can run away with him, I can do this and that and the other. And she came to a point where I said, Lord, it's yours. And I tell you, Every parent has to do this at some point. And what happened is, and you know the story, I haven't got time to tell you the story, she ended up being paid to look after her own child. Okay? We don't know how long she looked after him. Most of the commentators reckon it would have been about 12. It says when he was grown. When he was grown, she took him and he became the, daughter, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So her son, that she trusted the Lord for, she was paid to care for him for however many years it was, and then he went and he lived with the most powerful people in the world, had the best possible education, the abundance of God, if we are prepared to trust him. Yes, you can work it all out and struggle and strive and plan, or you can say, Lord, I trust you. Believe me, what you get back in return is so much greater. Anyway, then it says, uh, Hebrews 11, 24. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the, plas the passing pleasures of sin. When you look at Moses' life, what time are I finishing by? Is it quarter two? <laughs> what was I can't remember. I, I want to stick to the half hour, but I can't remember what I started. So no good looking at the clock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got a mind like a sieve. Moses, basically, when you look at life of Moses, you can divide into three sections. Moses, as with most people in that age, the average lifespan in that age was 120 years. It's quite an interesting study to look at lifespans in the Bible because Medusalah lived 900 years. By the time of Moses, 120 was about average, and there's all kinds of theories, and it's an interesting study to find out why that might be, and to consider why that might, might be. By the time of the Psalms, the Psalm says that normally it's 70 or 80 years, which is what's still the case, really, okay? But when you think about Moses' life, Moses wasn't particularly long-lived because his father lived 120, lives, 120 years, and most people did. And when you think about Moses' life, 40 years he spent in Egypt, okay? At the end of 40 years, he then went away to the desert, and I'll talk about that, and he spent 40 years in the desert. And then he came back, 
And then we have the whole business of the Exodus. And then he spent 40 years wandering with the Israelites. And he never got into the promised land. So there's three stages of, uh, of Moses' life. Um, <clears throat> when, from, from when he was, say, 12, we don't know for definite, he went to live with the, uh, the uh, and, and became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he was living in utter luxury. This was the household of the Pharaoh. And we know quite a lot about the household of the Pharaoh. They really did live it up. But also, they had the best educational system in the world. He would have been learned. He would have had all the advantages you could possibly have at that age. But there's one thing he had to do. He had to be Egyptian. Okay, and key, what we have to understand, and we forget these days, a culture in those days was very tightly connected to its faith, its religion. Being an Egyptian, you could not be Egyptian and be a monotheist. And up until the age of 40, he stayed on that course. And there came a time when he made a decision. You see, there's always a decision in faith. I've had discussions with people, and my father sometimes talks to me, he said, oh, I wish I had your faith. And he has this idea that faith is something that just happens. It's not. I'll tell you this, faith is always fundamentally a decision I will trust. And please don't expect that there will be all the proof laid out for you for you to do that. Never. God will always leave space for a decision over which there is no evidence. Because otherwise it isn't faith. There is always a place where you say, I am going to choose to believe that God will provide, that God loves me, that I will lay my hand in his life. So there came a point, I mean Moses was a third of the way through his life when he did this, it didn't do it immediately. But there came a point where Moses decided that he was going to be Hebrew. But he didn't, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't hero stuff, Moses, this is what I love about Moses. It says very carefully in Exodus, it says that... Um, Exodus 2.12, he says, because what happened basically, he went out one day and he saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. Sorry, I'm assuming people know this story. I, I'm afraid I haven't got time to tell you the whole story. Please read Exodus. It's very, very readable. It's a really good story. There came a time when Moses went out and he saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. And um, he was about 40 years old at the time. And he decided that he had to do something about it. So... You would expect him to be a great hero and to raise an army, etc., etc. And what it actually says is this. He looked this way and that, and when he saw that no one was around, he struck the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You know? He wasn't being a big hero. He didn't want to burn his boats. He wanted to just do what he had to do, but hide the evidence. He wasn't a hero. Yes. But here's the thing. God had other purposes for him. You know, there's, there's, there's Christians who say, I, I want to be a part of the Christian faith. I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to let go of the world. I don't want to burn the boats. I don't want to commit intellectual suicide. They say in education, if you become a Christian, you commit intellectual suicide. I don't want to go the whole hog. And the lovely thing is, I love this about the Lord. The Lord can do it for you. The Lord wants you to go that way. Yes, you can fight the Lord on it. But so often I find when I want to take half a step, the Lord says, well, amen, I'll accept that half a step, but I'm going to take you further. I love, you know, I'm not a strong guy. I love the fact, I'm coming back to this in a bit, I can be myself. I'm not the kind, I, I was the kind of guy as a kid that was always starting things and never finishing them. You know, I started doing stamp collecting and never finishing. Oh, the list of things that I started doing, and I always gave up. Okay. <laughs> but God took the limit of what I had and said, Amen. It's a move. I love that about the Lord. Jonah. Jonah, he told him to go to Nineveh, and he ran away. But the Lord just brought him back. I'll get you there. Isn't that lovely, the fact that we're not limited by our own personalities? All the Lord wants is a move. A step. So when, jo when Moses thought he'd got away with it, <laughs> he hadn't. The Lord 
had other purposes. So <coughs> Moses ended up, it says, uh, Exodus 2.27 says, by, sorry, um, it was Hebrews 2.27, Hebrews 11.27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. Not fearing the wrath of the king. I find that one difficult because if you read Exodus, you do get the impression he was a bit scared of the fact that, Moses, that Pharaoh was going to kill him. <laughs> but he left. And he left Egypt. And he left Egypt for 40 years. You know, the interesting thing about Moses... It says in Numbers, and I love this about him, he says, Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. He was a celebrity. He had all the education. He went and he saw this Egyptian beating up this Hebrew, and I don't know what was going on in his head, but I think what he was thinking was, here I am, I've got this privileged position, I'm a Hebrew, I'll go and defend him, and they'll all call me their leader, and they'll all think he's great, and we'll raise a, revolu a revolution, and we'll take all my people out, because here I am, I'm this ruler, I'm a celebrity, I'm a hero, and God said, no you're not. You know, I, I uh, have a very good friend, and uh, he makes me sick, <laughs> because... You know, you know I, I, have a, I have a little app on my phone and I can click on a word and it tells me the Greek meaning. But he speaks Greek. He speaks Hebrew. He is so clever. He knows all the power Christians and all these great people that we love to think are so marvelous. He knows them. He talks to them. I, I wouldn't dare go to talk to him. He's just one of these people that always floats to the top and he's so confident in himself and I spent years thinking I wish I wasn't me now, I spent years thinking if I'd been a drug addict or an I mean please I'm not you know if, if you, it's a horrible thing to go through but you'd have a, a testimony you could say oh I was this and it was terrible and then the Lord did this but I'm boring <laughs> I really have I'm nothing great it took me a long time to realize that God made me, me. And you do not have to be somebody else for God to work through you. I love that. There's a hymn that we used to sing, and I've got to be careful because if I try and quote things without having written it down, I forget them. But it said, Under the anointing daily let me live, a priest and king, relying not on fleshly energy, I smile to win. And here it is. A simple soul in contact with my Lord in whom all fullness is forever stored. You would not have noticed Moses in a convention. You wouldn't have noticed him in a crowded room. He wouldn't be the one first up on the stage. But it says of him, and this is wonderful, that God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to his friend. This meek man, the meekest man in the world is what it says. Moses may have thought he had all the advantages. You know, if he came into our church, we'd immediately put him in charge of the band or something like that. You know, he was a celebrity. He had all going and God said, no, no. God did use that. Moses probably wrote the first five books of the Bible. That was, that was excellent. God had a purpose in it. When he went back to, to, to bring the people out of Israel, it says that people respected him. He knew the people he was dealing with, so there was a purpose in it. But before Moses was ready for God to do anything with him, God had to bring him down and say, okay, yeah, you've got all that background, but you're nothing. Is that what I give you? Moses went away for 40 years. And here's the thing. Moses, after his first 40 years, had decided, right, I'm a Hebrew. All right, it didn't go quite as it planned, you know, I was going to hide him and sort of stay with one foot in either camp. Never mind, it went. Forty years later, and I trusted God with my life, what am I doing in, and the Bible calls it, the back end of the wilderness, herding sheep. Forty years later. So he made a decision to trust God with his life, and forty years later he was doing nothing. Let me tell you this. Faith has to be long. There are many, many situations in life where you say, or it's easy to say, God's forgotten. 
I did this years back and God's just forgotten. Imagine Moses' mother. She did this wonderful thing. She put him in the river. We don't know how long she lived, but they lived a long time. Wonderful. The son went to live in the Pharaoh's palace and the next thing he's off in the back end of the wilderness, charged with murder or whatever else. We live not by faith. Sorry. I'm going to switch that around. We live not by sight, but by faith. Let me tell you this. If you have put your trust in God, he can be trusted, even when things seem against it. Forty years, Moses, who made a decision to endure the hardship of the people of God rather than the pleasures of Egypt. Forty years. And then there came a time when uh, God called him, and you know the story, it's the story of the, uh, the burning bush and a very, very different Moses answered God's call. A Moses who said, who am I? I've got nothing. I can't talk well. You know, I'm, he was scared. He was himself. Amen for being ourselves. Please, we have all these images of Christians, these great, powerful people. God wants us to be ourselves. Because that is when God can use you. You know that. Because people see so much more than you think they see. They see into your heart. And you know, you ever get these people who stand up and you think, well, I can't quite see their heart. And you get others that say, but you say, Amen. I know what he is. Uh, there's someone used an expression the other day about being happy in their own skin. I love that expression. If you're noisy, if you're confident, be noisy and confident. Amen. If you're shy, be it. Okay? Be who you are and let God work through you. And then we've got the gold. I love that about Moses. I love the way that Moses was so fallible. Anyway, at the end of 40 years, God called Moses. He was herding sheep in the back end of the wilderness. That's the term the Bible uses. And uh, I reckon he'd pretty well given up hope by that stage. You know, there I was living in luxury in Egypt, and there I trusted God. And look, <laughs> God's timing is perfect. And he came back reluctantly. And you know the story. It's a, please read it. It's a wonderful story. Ten plagues. All these things. All these signs. In verse 29 it says, sorry, verse 20 it says, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Here we have a different Moses. Here we have a Moses whose God has been working on for 80 years through long periods of long faith. The, the, the fascinating thing about this is, you know, I thought a lot about the faith of going through the Passover. Moses had a firstborn son with him. He married a woman called Zipporah. And he had a son called Gershom. And another one called Eliezer. God will always bring it back to the things that are most personal to you. You know that. Children, mostly. And they're not just children. But... Faith is most difficult for those that are closest to you, the people that are closest to you. That's the hardest thing. I love the fact that Moses' mother's faith brought about blessing in Moses' life. It gives me hope. I love that fact. But there came a time when Moses, having seen what God did to the Egyptians and seeing that his own first if he didn't believe this, if he didn't sprinkle the blood, if he didn't do what he was told to do, his own firstborn would die. And finally, in verse 29, the Moses that God had been preparing for so long, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And Moses did what God had chosen him for. He brought his people out of captivity 
into their new life. 80 years. But God was at work. Visibly, invisibly, all the time God was at work. I find that encouraging. You see, faith is a journey. Paul talks about the measure of your faith and not exceeding the measure of your faith. Don't try to divide the waters when you've been saved three weeks unless the Lord gives you grace. Please, I'm not... Um, the Lord does sometimes give you specific grace. But faith is a journey. And the Lord, the thing the Lord wants more than anything else, because like I said at the beginning, faith is the most perfect form of worship. The Lord wants us to trust him. And to trust him for something more. I've often said, prophecy. I love to hear prophecy in a meeting, but that takes faith. You're always going to be thinking, it's just, just, just me. Stand up and do it. Someone will be blessed. Then you do it again. Someone will be blessed. You trust the Lord. And in your life, for your children, for your businesses, for your work, whatever it is, trust the Lord. And believe me, the things you receive from the hand of the Lord are so much better than what you work for your own effort. But then you move onwards. And you move onwards. And it's long. It can take years and years and years. But if you trust God, there's a lovely verse, of course, that says, All things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. Do we believe that or do we not? I'm on a project that was supposed to be finished about three months ago. I have my own business. I'm now losing money on that project. It's outside of my control. And if you're losing money on a project to have your own business, you know, every time I go and stay overnight and I've been there six or seven weeks, it cost me about £100 a night for a hotel. And I was despairing last week. I said, well, the Lord knows. You know, I'm fed up with being away from home. I really am. I'm uh, living in a premier inn next to a beef eater. The thing about beef eaters, they sell a lot of beef, steak. And believe it or, believe it or not, I, I'm fed up with steak. <laughs> they don't... But the Lord knows. I'm back there again tomorrow, probably. Whatever it is in your life, faith. See the unseen. We'll see the scene, that's visible. But as Christians we say, but there is more. But God. And then, our faith is not just a culture, our experience of God is not just a culture, it's personal.